man, there is a gorgeous, like the, I'm going to run outside and go look at this sky because it is, there's a multicolor, beautiful storm cloud just like right out my window. And I have been searching. Welcome to Following the Fire. Thanks for joining us on this journey through the wilderness. Just like Israel followed the pillar of fire and smoke, we want to take a new look at our beliefs and just follow him. And like Israel, we get it wrong a lot, we get lost a lot, but we're doing our best to to go where God leads us. I'm Nathan. And I'm Steve. Don't you know it's all I have? So today we dive into a deep and mysterious and complicated and confusing topic that we just say this thing, kind of accept it and move on. So we're going to spend some time discussing the doctrine of Trinity, this idea that three is one and one is three, and we dive into, is, is that really what we believe? And what does that mean for our lives? What does it mean for, for how I treat my neighbor or, or what I should do today? I had been screaming all these messages. Man, I've been getting so many good book re- recommendations and it's I I was going to my shelf my shelf that is books that I want to read is now full and so I was going to I was going to limit that I was going to use that as the physical limitation for I'm not allowed to buy any more books yeah but then I sent you that link that the weird christian twitter announced their what I thought was going to be books book of the month for people yeah. to discuss, and they chose three books for the month. Three. They're like, it was like, here's the one for July third. Here's the one for you know July fourteenth, and here's the one for July twentieth. And I didn't have any of them, so I was like, ah, I gotta buy three. I can't read books. that much. I got TV shows to watch. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah. I just stopped buying groceries. I've just been reading books and ordering takeout. <laughs> <laughs> it seems like there's a lot of books coming out right now, and. I, and that are around what we're talking about. And I don't know, once again, it's the, uh, it's what, whatever that effect is. I forgot what. Yeah. The, the VW bugs buying. Yeah. The buying a car effect, effect. Whatever you call that. I don't know if it's that I'm thinking about yeah. this stuff and now there's all these books, but it seems like, it seems like there are more of these books these days. Well, I've, I've always struggled with, um, how do you find a good book? Because I would just go to the, I, the bookstore and look at shelves of books. Yeah. That's a very bad way to buy it. But all of a sudden we have a pipeline for people to recommend books to us. Yeah. Uh, Especially if we make some offhand comment in the podcast about some topic or an author or anything, we can talk about it for 30 seconds and someone's going to be like, Oh, there's a great book about that. (laughs) Yeah. And so, and it turns out they like every recommendation I've gotten has been fantastic so far. So, yeah, definitely hit the the gold mine for stellar book recommendations. But I have Mint, my uh, budgeting software, is giving me alerts that I am overspending on <laughs> books compared to my entire life. <laughs> What's going on, Nathan? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think your credit card has been stolen. It happens every time I buy shoes too. Because I buy them so infrequently. Oh, really? Like, uh, we've noticed suspicious activity on your account. <laughs> oh, that's funny. You, you bought shoes. Yeah, I've been I've been reading Jesus and John Wayne, and I think mm-hmm. I'm maybe two thirds of the way through. And oof, looking forward to talking about that one because <laughs> it's heavy. I just I just finished the introduction. The preface, do you read the preface? Yes. I always I always have to start at the very beginning. I can never skip to the end. It's like a sickness I have. So just finish the preface, introduction, and first chapter. So barely into it. Yeah, it's, 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 it's heavy, but it's good. So that, it's our next book club, like next official, official book club discussion. That's right. It's uh, going to be released on July 7th. And we're going to have a bonus book club on 
June 30th, we're going to be talking about the book Affirming by Sally Gary. This is a special bonus book club because we are going to have the, our guest is the author, Sally Gary. That's right. And so we're going to be, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about that. I've read the book, I, we both have, and it's it's really good. And we kind of wanted to squeeze it in at the end of Pride Month because it has to do with LGBTQ plus issues and dealing with that with the church, specifically Churches of Christ is where Sally Gary has, has grown up and is still a part of. Yet she is married to a woman, which is not common in the Churches of Christ, <laughs> I will say. Not common. But but man, the book the book could almost you take about two percent of it out, the book could almost read as just a memoir of growing up in the Church of Christ. Oh, I know. I, just the the whole way reading through. It's like, oh man, me too. You know, like wow. Well, and if you listen to the audio version, you get to hear her singing actually some of the hymns. It's really it's actually kind of cool. Oh wow. When it, is that a good is she good yeah, at it? Yeah, it's great. It, yeah, she's the, great. Oh uh, yeah, never mind. She grew up in the three generations <laughs> of the Of course she could sing. Just, yeah, exactly. Total conceptualization. Oh, that's funny. If, so that's yeah. going to be June 30th is Affirming by Sally Gary and and June July 7th will be the book club Jesus and John Wayne by Kristen Dumay. I feel like the best thing to do with a problem or an addiction like my book buying addiction is to spread it to other people. Oh, absolutely. So then it normalizes it. Exactly. It makes me feel better about myself because I've dragged other people down to my level. So two books uh, for the price of one. And the links for all those are going to be on the website. So, today, I wanted to talk about another topic that at least a couple of folks have requested. And I was thinking when it comes to deconstruction of your faith, what better place to start than deconstructing the concept of God? And so this 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 whole thing is a, it's something that I've been actually studying really pretty pretty deeply off and on for about eight years. And I'm going to kind of go through a lot of the the stuff that I've learned. I pared it down from 10 pages of notes to less than that. (laughs) 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 9.5. I have it in like this note, my Apple notes program, and there's no page break. So I'm not sure how long this is, but. um, One page. Yeah. yeah, I removed. (laughs) It's a scroll. It's like, uh, who's the author that wrote? um, Who's the beatnik? generation author who the legend is he wrote the book on the road off the road home again and away again um in in one sitting on a scroll of paper one continuous scroll. jack kerouac, like the, jack kerouac yeah really he what's wrote that what's the book jack on the road i hadn't heard that about him yeah one page <laughs> very long one book page one notes. page long yeah it's kind of like ulysses it's a very long book one sentence long basically <laughs> right yeah, so with with the with the concept of God, what's one of the first things that comes to mind for you, Nathan, when we talk about the quote unquote Judeo Christian concept of God? Oh, I <laughs> I'm so bad at answering these questions because uh I just had a conversation about God with my six year old son. Oh, those are hard. They ask actual questions. <laughs> they ask real questions. And from a What's the word? Interfaith? I don't know. His, his mom does not believe the same mm-hmm. things that I do. And so he actually asks questions about God all the time. Really? Um, and, I, and I'm glad because for a while he was only asking those questions at her house hmm. because it was, let's, you know, the thing that was missing fr- oh. from there. So that there wasn't a reason to talk about it here. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. But I realized I needed to let the conversation happen here too. So kind of made some changes to how I was talking about things to drive some curiosity. But so he was talking about how there's a lot of people believe in lots of different gods and there's all kinds of gods. And so he's at his conception of God has actually been, I think it's funny. It's very, uh, it's very 
uh, Near East Ancient. It's like, yeah, so we worship the god of Fort Collins, but mom lives in Loveland. So there's a different god in Loveland. And really? some people, so it, it was kind of like, you know, God's regional regional deities. Yeah. Is kind of his idea, um, which I feel like is a pretty logical conclusion to come to from in his situation. Yeah. Um, and he's learned that there are lots of gods. Nobody knows who the real one is. People believe different things. And then he said, mom, mom likes the gods that are girls. <laughs> and I said, and so, so that drove our conversation, which is that I said, well, God isn't a girl, but God isn't a boy. He said, he said, what? So yeah, God, God's not a human. God, God, God doesn't have a gender. God is non-binary, not a girl or a boy. <laughs> and we, we talked about that for a while, but I feel like that, I feel like people agree with that kind of, but you know, anyways, my, so we had been talking about the gender of God, which is the first thing I think of, but I, I do think of Monty Python, Zeus in the, in the clouds and then kind of a, um, a personal, but incomprehensible force. Yeah, it's interesting that you mentioned the gender thing because I, I, I was going to say that I think I think I I agree. Most people would probably agree with you that technically God doesn't have a gender, but he's pretty masculine. <laughs> is is the <laughs> is the uh, well the beard you know <clears throat> right? I mean, let's skip over all of the the sections of the Bible that talk about God being like a mother and gathering the chicks and all this stuff. But it, it kind of brings me back to that Jesus and John Wynne book. It's, it's of the the mas- masculinization or the machoization of Jesus. It's very hard to get away from that, though. Even in our intro to the podcast, it's very hard. You either have to say God all the time and never use pronouns. Yeah. But that gets tiresome yeah. in English and in every language. And so we say following him, right? he, and we use male pronouns. I thought uh, I thought it was funny. Ted Lasso, uh, the, this show. Oh, that's a good show. Um, about the uh, you know kind of underestimated American football coach who who gets conscripted to coach a British football team, which I highly recommend the show if you if uh, swearing doesn't offend you. Yeah, it, it's one of the best shows I've ever seen. Anyway, just as a it was a throwaway line, and there are it's a dense it's like gilmore girls meet soccer how uh how dense the the references are and the throwaway jokes uh he he just i thought it was funny that he calls god her right which is yeah i caught that you know like everything else that he talked about he he's from the deep south and uh that means in mainstream media they know that it's kind of a humorous or a that's a way to throw people off that um, yeah it, it well, it's a way to show that you are uh, progressive. Yeah, yeah. It's a way to get conservative people to stop listening to you, and a way to to signal that yeah that you that you're progressive. We don't have a. I guess we could say they. Yeah. Be good. Pro- which maybe we should have asked God what his pronouns are. That's kind of rude of us. <laughs> yeah. So all of those things. Uh, I think are definitely things that people think about when they think about the concept of God. Um, one thing that is a, a core concern for people, and it, it's one of those, it's one of those beliefs that is so ingrained in us that we don't even think about it. Sometimes, it's the concept of the Trinity. That's what I want to talk about because it's something nebulous and hard to understand, and I think that specifically because it's one of those things that we just automatically assume is decided and let's move on. I think that that's exactly one of the reasons I want to talk about it. And we can talk about it at the end of this discussion, whether, whether or not it matters. But um, growing up in a, in a church, what kinds of explanations were you given or were you, did you hear for how to describe how God is somehow three personalities in one but still there's one god and there's not three gods and that kind of thing 
I'm going to strike out again because I actually, thinking back, this was this was not actually something that I that was talked about very often in my upbringing. Oh, okay. um, so I would say we we actually tended to focus on maybe the three aspects, but always one at a time. So we might have a class on the spirit, mm-hmm. or we might have well, that's it. <laughs> that's but the the actual talking about what God is or the or or what that means for us was i think something that i don't i didn't have very much of growing up the conversations i've heard about the trinity are mostly from outside of the church of christ mhm i've heard the three leaf clover yeah um just as a how to describe something that you could point to something that's three but also count it as one yeah one thing yeah. my conception of the trinity probably only in my church of christ upbringing mostly comes from songs um where we maybe use the you know change one word in the verse father we love you spirit we love you and jesus we love you yeah. Um, or just phrases like baptizing in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Yeah, it, that's interesting that you actually point that out now that, I, now that you say that, because growing up, the, the emphasis was on teaching about God. When it's Old Testament, you talk about God, in, in, implying the Father. Yeah. And then when you talk about the New Testament stuff, you t- we tended to talk about Jesus, which is the Son. And then like Holy Spirit stuff that happened back in Acts and that, and then it stopped. <laughs> and well, and we'll we'll remind ourselves we're like, oh, wait a minute, we are, we should talk about the spirit for a while. So it right, it comes up, but it's at least from my, you know, I've I've been to many different churches of Christ, you know, visiting, and the it's just not a topic that I've ever heard explored in a sermon or a class or even at uh, my Christian college. Again, not. Not really something I came across. And I, I think it's actually, I think part of the, that is baked into the, actually the Church of Christ movement, the the Restoration movement. Yeah. Was a, a combination of these two move, movements, Stone and Campbell. One of them did not really believe in the concept of the Trinity. Oh, really? So, yeah, Barton Stone. I didn't know that. He didn't think that the spirit was kind of not mentioned, but even Jesus and God, he didn't, he thought that it was illogical that there would be a two being or three being co-eternal thing. And Campbell, that made Campbell kind of uncomfortable, but Hmm. Trinity is not a Bible name, you know, Mm -hmm. it's not. And so it became, because there was disagreement, the, the the whole point of the movement was a unity movement. And so it became de-emphasized. And I think that it would not be wild to claim that churches of Christ in general tend to, yeah, just de-emphasize, not, not on purpose, but it's just not, not baked into our thought about God. Yeah. Even, I agree. Even if we weren't talking about Trinity, I feel like curiosity about God or diving into the, the the character of God is even kind of a can be a fearful step to happen in a church of Christ because you I think we're all just supposed to know. Yeah. We're all kind of supposed to come together and know already. Yeah, yeah and that's one reason I I actually started really getting into this when I was teaching a class at church forever ago about the Holy Spirit. And as you said, the Holy Spirit's something that in Churches of Christ and most a lot of the Stone Stone Campbell movement stuff, Restoration movement. That's it's very, it's not talked about much Holy Spirit, and it's just the act of the like miraculous stuff is is constrained to basically the first and maybe parts of the second century. And the and anyway, I started researching the Holy Spirit and then I got into the this concept of the Trinity and it just kind of blew my mind a little bit. 
Um, I mean, it's 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 always whenever the topic comes up, we there's always these ways that we try to explain it. Like you said, the the, the clover. Um, I've heard an egg, like the shell, the white, and the yolk. States mm-hmm. of water, ice, liquid, <laughs> okay. and gas. Same stuff, but different views of it. Apple, like the skin, the the white part, and the seeds. Uh, pick, basically, pick anything that has three parts in it. I saw some like sure. some youth ministry thing that said uh, comparing it to Twix, the the cookie, the chocolate, and the caramel. <laughs> I was like, "There's two Twix. What a, what a bad." <laughs> The Twix, the other Twix, and then you throw away the wrapper because, I mean, what are You're we going to do? Maybe a Kit Kat and break one of them off, throw it away. <laughs> uh, and, and then the best the best one that I came across was the three-headed knight from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> it's going to be my go-to from now on. Yeah. And there are, the, the term you use is Trinitarianism, and there are so many other isms around the concept of God. It's not even funny. There's... Unitarianism, tritheism, modalism, partialism, Arianism, and monarchianism, and I could probably go on. Yeah, but, there's there's definitely more. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, it's it's a topic that it's been on the top of the list for thing for people for for theologians and for Christians for a long time, or at least it was for a while, and then it seems like when it was once it was decided by some of the early church councils and everybody quit trying to dig into it. Hmm. It's just, it was assumed that it was decided and let's move along. And with all these isms, I think it's hard to discuss things in the spiritual world when you're stuck in a physical one. And so it's hard to to talk about this stuff partially because there's not a lot of information and partially because it's uncomfortable because we don't know the terms to use or how to describe things. Uh, it's and and we're also told that you should just accept the idea of the Trinity or the the Godhead uh, as true and accurate, because God's nature is so far beyond ours. You, you're never going to understand it. You're never going to get it. Or God's thoughts are above our thoughts, and it's just how it is. And basically, for hundreds of years, the church has been. I feel like anyway, the church has been saying and this is the global church in general has been saying here, let me teach you something that I don't understand and you won't understand either, but it's central to our faith. So you better believe in it. (laughs) I'm like, right. And I, I don't, I think it's just the way I was raised to question things. Uh, but especially now with the stage of my faith that I'm in, I just can't accept that. I can't accept that God would, I, I mean, I feel like God's, the best teacher there is. And he he knows what how we want to understand things and how he and he knows how to convey those things to us in a way that we would understand them. But I mean good teachers teach you things. They don't make you guess at the answer. And I really think that God's not unclear about who he is and what his nature is and how we can conceive of him. I don't feel like he's trying to trick us like uh sticking dinosaur bones in the in the ground to make you think that the earth's old, but it's not. So, like I said, I, I kind of embarked on a journey to figure out what the Bible actually has to say about the Trinity and the nature of God in general. And the good news is, I found all the answers. <laughs> Great. Lay them, lay them on us. <laughs> I did not find all the answers. Steveism. <laughs> what I did find is that almost all of the teachings about the Trinity begin with the assumption that there is a Trinity and then explaining what it means. And like you said, Nathan, the, the term Trinity is nowhere in the Bible. And the concept of the Trinity is not even, I would say, obviously in the Bible either. Uh, and what's interesting, what it also interested me was that the development of the concept can clearly be seen through history. Right. Uh, it's not that it just popped up and was there. So... So as far as scripturally goes, um, I, I don't feel like there's a solid support of the, for the concept in scripture. The ones that are used to support it mostly are stories like when Jesus' baptism in Matthew three sixteen. 16. Uh, it says, as soon as Jesus was baptized, he went, came up out of the water. 
And then the, the, the dove comes down and lands on him and says, it says the spirit of God descending on him like a dove. And the voice from heaven said, this is my son with whom I love and with him I am well pleased. So you've got Jesus, you've got the spirit coming down like a dove and you've got G- God speaking from the heavens. So you've got three things going on. Right. And then there's the great, com- great commission where we're told to baptize in the name of the father and the son and the Holy spirit. And then there are a few verses where the three are mentioned several times in a sentence, like may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy spirit be with you all, that kind of thing. And there are some, like if, if you're a King James person, a lot of people think of Colossians 2, 9, then in the King James, it says for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Sorry to burst King James bubble, but the, the word should be translated deity, not Godhead. It's one of those, they wanted to have the concept of the Trinity in the Bible, and it wasn't there, so they added that word. But it just right. says deity. Yeah. And there's also 1 John 5, 7 says, For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Once again, not in the Bible, actually. The those words as are actually not found in manuscripts until the 14th century. And the the translation should be there are three that testify the spirit, the water, and the blood. These three agree. So that's that's about the extent of things in the Bible that are pro-Trinity, I guess. Everything is dark, you are my light. Loneliness surrounds you are my friend You never leave my side until the end Who Yeah I, I'll let me uh, throw a bone real quick to, to the trinitarians cuz I this is it's such a big concept that we're talking about that theologians talk about and I didn't talk, think about or talk about very much in church, but I have thought a lot about what I grew up doing with scripture, which was looking at it at a granular level. And I would say that the argument for, for the Trinity doesn't, and I don't think can come out of any single verse. There's not a verse that says God has three aspects and they're co-eternal mm-hmm. and they, and the, they're three persons, but it's actually just one thing there. There's, that's not, that's not anywhere in there. So the way that people came to that conclusion was they, they had Jesus and John, the church father that got to live a long time and think about things for a long time, seemed to think Jesus was God. So, There's Jesus existing, being God, but being with God. And and then there's God. We're all familiar with that because we're from this Jewish tradition. And then there's this helper and these other things and the spirit. And what does that mean? Mm -hmm. None of that would be a problem really even or anything to explain if it weren't for the Shema, which is like the core part of Judaism. And it's practically what Jesus quoted when he said, what's the greatest commandment? He's kind of skipped, skipped the part that says the Lord, your God, the Lord is one. Yeah. But it was so, so anyways, the second or third or fourth century thinkers, what they were doing was trying to reconcile the Shema with these various ideas that were that seemed to contradict the Shema. So, so the, so it, I think it's somewhat has to do with, it's a little bit of a leap, um, but some has to do with either the broad view, like trying, just trying, trying to reconcile something that doesn't actually get explicitly stated. And kind of what you're saying is like, if it's, if it's foundational, why doesn't anyone explicitly ever say it? Yeah, and, and I mean, that's a 
it's exactly what happened. It seems like because I mean, the, in the Old Testament, like verses that are pro or that seem to be against the concept, I mean, there's a ton of them. Like the Shema, uh, Shema Yisrael was from Deuteronomy six, and that's that's like the core one. And there's a bunch of other ones all sprinkled throughout. The the emphasis just being on on the oneness of God, the concept of the single deity. Yeah, so the ancient Jews were monotheists. They believed this strict monotheist being one God, and Jesus was the same. Uh, he was also a, a monotheist, and I mean, he mentioned forces of evil like demons and devils, but not gods. And he also taught that that when God the Father returned, his followers would be raised from the dead. But so one thing, some things we learned from history is that when the early Christians had this idea that, that God would return and set up his kingdom during their lifetime. And when that didn't happen, they realized something else must be going on. Right. And so just like a lot of ancient cultures believe that if you were taken to heaven, especially if you're set at the right hand of God, then you had to be in some way divine or you had to, you had become divine. They had this concept that you could, go from being a human to becoming a, a god. So Christians began to see Jesus, more and more Christians began to see Jesus as divine, although not God the Father, because monotheism. And so some they had to figure something out, like you were talking about. The, the, how can Jesus be divine and God be divine, but there's only one God? And originally the the... The discussion and the, the the debates were about just Jesus and the Father. Spirit was not in part of the discussion for quite a while, and there were lots of views about what it meant. Like, had Jesus always been God? Has was he a man who uh, on whom deity was bestowed at his baptism? Was that spirit coming down like him becoming deity? Right. Was he created by God? Was he like a lower level deity? I mean, all these, I mean, there's, you could go on and on with the options for that as well. And in the first few centuries after Christ, lots of views developed like that, like the modalism, like I mentioned earlier, was this idea that modalism means that, that God shows up in different modes, in different ways. Like the God, the Father is one view of him, and the Son is a different view, just like I am a father and I am a son. And I'm a brother, yeah. things like yeah. that. So one person can be multiple things without being three different people. And coming into the third century, uh, this that was the most popular thing. And then there's a huge backlash. And it was eventually deemed as heresy. People at the time were very insistent that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit all had three separate distinct personalities, and they're different beings. By the early 4th century, almost every Christian believed that Jesus was deity in some way, but the disagreement came down to what does that mean and how does it work, which is kind of still mm -hmm. where we're stuck today, <laughs> to be honest. Yeah, and I, I would say, you know, plain reading is, is not always the best, but an intuitive reading of Scripture, I think you would come away thinking that God... And Jesus and the Spirit are three different things. I think the you, you would you would see stories of God's will and Jesus's will being different, but also them talking to each other or knowing different things. You'd see Jesus sending out the Spirit or promising the Spirit or being full of the Spirit. Yeah. Um, so I I do think that it's biblically logical if. If someone just picked up a Bible off the street and read anything in the New Testament, I think they would think, okay, there's God. Okay, there's Jesus. I would actually add my conception. If I if I had had to construct my theology from when I turned 18, it, I, I think I would have had God, Jesus, and the church. Hmm. And, and I would have said, I don't get it. I don't get why it's marriage. That's a weird analogy. 
but we're the bride of Christ, yeah. and then there's the father, I don't know, overseeing the thing. But that's, I mean, that's a, just talking about how the God, Jesus, and the bride thing, you know, Paul's like, and this is a mystery, and, you know. Mm-hmm. But I think, I do think it's logical to come to a conclusion and say, okay, there's these three things to deal with at least, at least three, but that would be a complete rewriting of what we think we understand from the Old Testament. Yeah, and the, like, just speaking of the Spirit, for example, the Spirit of God's mentioned in the Old Testament a couple, a couple, three times. I mean, the Spirit as a, I think it's mentioned a lot in the Old Testament, but so is like the wisdom of God or the glory of God as kind of personifications of, of an aspect of God. Yeah. Which actually gets into Trinitarianism. If you start with Trinitarianism, then you read back and say the logic of God, you know, the word of God is actually Jesus or the, um, or Jesus is the glory of God. Or, you know, you, you kind of take some of those things, but the, the breath of God or the Ruach of God is all over, all over the, but the, the Israel, you know, the ancient Israelites probably weren't thinking of that as a separate Steve and the spirit of Steve are not two different things. Right. And I think that that's kind of where I'm, where I come down to when looking, I, I forgot that I have this entire four page thing of spirit <laughs> scriptures of the spirit in the old Testament all the way from Genesis 1, 1, like you said, all the way through. And it's almost always just a different way to describe God being there. And this, this Holy Spirit, Spirit filling people once in a while with to give them uh, skills and abilities. Yeah, it, it is kind of a specific aspect because it's like the, it just means breath and wind and etc., but it's kind of the the thing that animates and moves life. Like the, the Spirit of God is what gets breathed into Adam and animates him into a, an alive being, but it's also the thing that continuously sustains the trees and the birds and the it's the, it's the moving thing around that's invisible, but that kind of is the little spark. Yeah, and... I mean, God is described as having a spirit, just like we man is described as having a spirit. The breath of God it breathes into man and makes him alive. Right. And so, looking through, I mean, the who is the Holy Spirit is another entire <laughs> big thing that maybe we should have done first. But uh, <laughs> this, the whole idea of what the Holy Spirit is in the Old Testament is it's almost always described as just an aspect of God. Maybe not the modalism thing, but this idea that it's it's very akin to my spirit within me yearning for freedom and God being a spirit himself as as in in the spiritual world as far as we can understand it. To me, I don't see it, you it would be really hard to read the Old Testament and and think that there are two aspects of God that are two separate personalities. Yeah. I mean, I, I think I would have come away with five that if you were, if if you were reading through the old Testament, I do think you would, you would see the messenger of God. You would see the spirit of God. You'd see the glory of God. You'd see the word of God. And, and they're often used as people. Mm -hmm. Like then the, I don't know, glory of God descended on something or then I'm, I'm drawing a blank, but, the, but they're, they're used like the something of God in Psalms or something is used as a, as a poetic way to refer to God, but to draw out a certain aspect of God. And the, right. yeah, so we're, I'm, I'm kind of saying the same thing that those things are there. But again, if you were, I don't know, Zechariah, you wouldn't have you wouldn't have thought twice about. I don't know. The spirit seems separate and apart. You, you would have you would have just seen that and, and thought of the one God again. 
Yeah, and when thinking about who the Holy Spirit is, I, I try to think about what would Jesus and the his apostles and disciples have thought of God and the, and the Spirit? And, I mean, they they knew the Spirit was with them, and they had learned all these wonderful things the Spirit of God had done in their lives of people around them, and but they they wouldn't have thought, especially because of the serious emphasis on the oneness of God. I don't think they would have thought of, and there's no evidence that they thought of the Spirit being separate from God. Because God is the God is spirit, God is God has a spirit. And so when the just like you were saying, the the word of God or the uh, the judgment of God, all these things of God that are described in the Old Testament are just describing aspects of him, ways that he does things or ways he interacts with people. But all coming back to the, there's a, a single oneness of God. And I think they would have had a really hard time accepting that they were even coming up with the idea that there were somehow two in one. And maybe some of this is semantics, I guess. I don't know. Well, it's, I think much of it is semantics, but there's, there are significant implications of some of the, some of the isms for sure. Um, I, I would say, cause I, I'm, I'm very, I'm I'm very reluctant about some of these things because I I think because I've been nervous about how much in my upbringing biblical meant can you find a verse to support it but that the idea that the forest is is a different view than I get from the individual trees so the hmm. I I do think there the conception of the spirit of God like if you, um, I was just talking the other day about um, John the Baptist, who is this weird example of uh, John the Baptist is, is full of the Spirit from conception, mm -hmm. and then he, for all we know, lived a, for all we know, lived a sinless life. Meaning, he he has never talked of as doing anything but fulfilling his vow that he made to the Lord. Right. For his whole life, he's not Samson. He he actually did it. He he uh, he it was a Nazarene or whatever whatever he is, and full of the Spirit. And I think before you get to Jesus, I think that a a Jew, an Israelite, would have understood. Yeah, when you're full of the Spirit, that means you have a special. God has indwelled you in a special way for a specific purpose. Right. So the so they they did have ways to think about what does it mean to have the spirit of God? Right. Um and it often is talked about as a filling. You know, maybe maybe even I I would have come away from the Old Testament with a like God is the spirit or God the spirit moves through all things or animates all things. Um, it's mm -hmm. very uh, Zen, but uh, <laughs> then people have temporary times when they get filled with it. I, and, and then, you know, they do something and then I kind of assume then after that they're, they don't have it anymore because it, it did its thing. Yeah. And there's a, a lot of the old Testament examples are then the full of the spirit. David does something crazy or, <laughs> You know, but it but it was definitely like, oh, okay, somehow God sometimes will. It's like an anointing or a or a power or an authority or something, but it's it's to do something. It's to go out and and move you to to action. So there's definitely a a concept that you have if you're a you know one of the fishermen, and then you're describing this scene of. Jesus and the spirit coming on him, what you're going to expect is he's, he's just gotten that special filling up of whatever that was that happened to people in the old Testament. So now he's going to go do something with that. T 
Tears fill my eyes, you hear my cry. Everything is dark, you are my light. Loneliness surrounds, you are my friend. You never leave my side until the end. Let me back up a little bit. I think I've. I think I may be maybe burying the lead. Uh, <laughs> so the way I, I after reading lots of things, lots of books and commentaries, all that stuff, and trying to make sense of it and congeal it down into some tasty Jello that makes sense to me. The way I'm approaching this topic is I. I try to imagine myself like as a person who has lived for thousands of years. If I was a observer of the Old Testament, and you know, I can try to try to imagine that by re- reading the things in the Old Testament that are said about God, that God says about Himself, that people say about Him, then I, I think I would think, especially with the the Jewish emphasis on the oneness of God. Every time that says the Spirit of God, I would just insert God. That's just God. Nah, yeah. God and Spirit, same thing. There's no distinction. Uh, it's just the way he's doing things in different ways with, with different powers or whatever. I don't know. So I, I when I look at the Old Testament, I don't see any distinction between the two. There's The terminology is used inter- interchangeably. Then I come into the New Testament, and if, if I'm a Jewish person like Jesus and the apostles at the, at the time, and I would have that concept of God that he's one God, because there's tons of writings at the time, we know that, like from the mission and all that stuff, that it was very, very important that there was only one God, and that he was one personality, then I would see the things happening around me and the the workings of God around me, and even with the, the like on the day of Pentecost when the tongues of fire were on the heads, I'd say, oh, so that's that's God showing Himself to us, yeah. God giving us certain abilities. So, when I am looking at this from the twenty twenty one Steve, looking back at the the concept of the Trinity that has been was developed over time, one thing I notice is that. For for the longest time, there was the the Christians had seemed to have the idea that God was God, just like the Israelites and the, the Jewish people did. God is God. There's an, there's no concept of this Holy Spirit thing being separate. It's like Holy Spirit instead of being like a name, was a descriptor. Yeah, the Spirit that is the holiest of spirits because it's God's Spirit. So I'm completely tracking with what you're saying. I I do think again. Having grown up without really ever been taught any actual theology, theology, I just made up the definition, meaning ways to think about the Bible as opposed yeah. to just thinking by reading the Bible. So my intuitive understanding after reading the Bible a lot, but not really being taught about specific f- isms of any kind. I had a conception that there's one God and that the Holy Spirit is just that and that, yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I totally get what, what you mean, that the Spirit's all over the Old Testament and and never uh, never thought of as as a challenge to the Shema. Right. And I actually am... I actually am interested in what you have for the the history because the Council of Nicaea is like 300 AD. Was there anything in between, you know, the Book of John, 90 AD, and uh, and the Council of Nicaea? Yeah. So coming into that area of history, uh, what what we seem to see from history is that that Jesus was a strict monotheist. The apostles were, as all the Jews were. The Spirit and God, same same thing. The same person, I guess. And then you get into the history of 
we see more thought and more writings popping up slowly over time that Jesus is in, is, is in some way deity. Like I said, there's different opinions about what that meant, right? whether that he represented everything about God or whether he actually was God, etc. And the first time that the term Trinity is even is ever used is by a church father, I think we probably refer to them as, his name is Tertullian. And that was in 216 AD, I think. Mm-hmm. Tertullian and, and Hippolytus were both both guys who their kind of self-assigned job was to find heresy and to stamp it out. And tr- but Trinity, the, is the etymology of Trinity tri-unity? Is it trying to say yeah. it's one is three, it's one, it's, it's one but it's the three. triune it's, God, yeah, yeah. triune. So it's three, three oneness. It's kind of... A, right, and sometimes it's used, it, the term that they used it was triad. Okay. Like three points on a triangle. And but this idea of of the Trinity, just even the concept of it, was not fully formed because it was it was mentioned by Tertullian as a here are these aspects of God, but it, like you mentioned, the Council of Nicaea in three twenty five A D, it was called by Constantine to settle some major disputes because Constantine, being a very pragmatic guy, seems to have converted to Christianity in order to use it to uh, to unite the Roman Empire. So he didn't want disunity. He wanted everybody to get along and agree on the same thing. So he realized there needs to be some common understanding of what this stuff is. And the huge debate at the time was not, is Jesus some way God, but what's that mean? And the big, the two big ones were the Arian view of God... The Father created the Son and the Spirit versus the Alexander Alexandrian view of what basically what most of us believe now, that the the three are in very the same way, the same essence or the same substance. And that substance is like God clay. <laughs> They're all made out of the same clay, if you think of it that way. And the, same stuff. The there's a there's a hierarchy in the one and there's a equality in the other one. Right. The Aryan view is kind of a hierarchy view. God, God's like the head God. And then he's got like then subordinate two gods. helpers. Yeah. And so that was a huge debate. And the debate raged for quite a while and did for decades and uh, centuries afterwards, but Alexander, the Alexandrian view won, and that kind of became the Orthodox view. And it's essentially is, is God one is Jesus, are Jesus and God the same or was God created, or did God create Jesus? And like I mentioned earlier, the the discussion had, like, the Holy Spirit wasn't part of the discussion. It was just between God and Jesus. And so they came up with the Nicene Creed based upon what they uh, decided upon. Their presentation. After the, anytime you have a committee, especially if it's called by the CEO, you got to, you got to give your, your report out. So. Right. That's their PowerPoint. And the original one said, the original Nicene Creed said, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of all things, invisible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, begotten of the Father, and then light of light, very God, of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. And then... And the Holy Spirit. Su- there's, a, <laughs> there's more stuff. No, yeah. Holy Spirit wasn't in there at all. Not at all? Okay. No, not at all. And then... They also figured out when Easter was going to be. <laughs> if you ever wonder why Easter is when it, when it is, <laughs> Nicene Creed, the, Ni- the Council of Nicaea. And then in 381 AD, the Emperor Theodosius wanted to have another, they were having more dust ups in the church. And he wanted to once again maintain unity in the, in the empire. And so the main point of contention was is this a trinity or is it a duality? And so they had the Council of Constantinople, and since they had determined the Jesus and Father relationship in 325, the Holy Spirit was left undecided, so it was mostly the Council of Constantinople was talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And so after after that, they added to the Nicene Creed, and in the Holy Ghost, the Lord giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, etc., 
So the, the Nicene Creed as we know it now, initially just had God, God and the Father and the Son, and then in 381 they added the Spirit. Then the, the Athanasian Creed in the 6th century kind of solidified it a bit more. And that's really where we get the foundation of the doctrine, quote-unquote, of the Trinity. Right. Were these meetings of meetings of the minds of people to figure out what, how, how to make this, like you said earlier on in the podcast, how to make the sense of, we've got a couple gods here, <laughs> but we're supposed to only have one. <laughs> what do we do? And so just try to try to make sense of that. And honestly, I think one of the reasons we haven't really, for the large part, haven't really taken a, a hard look at that seems to be that, I mean, the Catholic Church did what the ancient Catholic Church did, and you said there wasn't a trinity, you got killed. Or you got exiled, depending on how much money you had. So it squashed any kind of a dissent, and it just became one of these things that we just... It seems like to me we just agree that ha- has like is the right thing, right? And so what what can what are, where I started coming down with coming up with a or a viewing this as a different thing than the Trinity possibly, I, and I should have should have said at the beginning, I still haven't decided what I believe on all this stuff, right? <laughs> These are the the things that I'm thinking right now, and the things that I think I'm thinking. And I could be completely wrong, but you know, it's, it's where we are. The fact that the idea of the Trinity didn't wasn't really solidified for nearly 400 years after Jesus, to me, says something. And then I, then I start thinking, okay, if, if there's not a Trinity, maybe there's a duality, or maybe our concept of Jesus' as deity is something different than we thought it was, the fact that all that has changed so much, I, I wonder if we did away with the whole concept of the deity, or the, not the deity, the whole concept of the Trinity, and just said that there's one God, period, with not these multiple ways to look at it and view it, what does that really change for my relationship with God? I mean, do you, do you see what I'm getting at? Yeah, Um yeah, and we, I think that this is something I've been looking at also, but it's like we're in the same place going different directions because I, I didn't have any of this concept at all. And so I've been doing this thing, which is like the opposite of questioning, which is like, maybe the church, the global church as a whole it, it is slowly getting things better and better and better and 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 that that's kind of the movement, my Trinity be kind of being the God, the Jesus and the church as a, uh, and the church being something that's going to be continuously formed into the, into the, I don't know, into completion. Mm -hmm. And so my reaction against my upbringing is that I'm part of the restoration movement, which means we scrapped everything and started from scratch. And so the rejection of that is like, well, let's, you know, maybe the church, the church being, you know, there's all kinds of problems with the emperor of Rome being the person who calls the meeting, but the, the church being the, the group that's been slowly figuring that out and that has, is, you know, determining that stuff. So I, as I, I've been thinking about like, how does, how do these things impact I, I do think a lot of it is semantics, kind of like you said, or the, you know, always the example we joke about, you know, are we just talking about how many angels can dance on the, t- on the head of a pin? Right. That being a real theological debate yeah, that ha- has happened before. So, but I have, I have heard people explain why it matters and it's totally clicked with me, but I'm very much in that place of trying to figure out like, I, d- I didn't have a foundation of a relationship with God in the first place. You know, I knew I was supposed to, but I didn't, didn't have that built. So I've been like really trying to go back to the basics and it turns out nobody agrees on the basics. Right. 
Um, yeah, and, and I mean the, the the Trinity seems to be some. It should be the most basic of things that everybody understands. And I'm maybe I'm the only one who still has issue with that. I mean, maybe I'm so su- maybe I'm supposed to just like say. I can't understand it. There's no way I can understand it and move along. And and maybe it wouldn't matter. I don't know. Yeah. The, well, the I've I remember uh, it being brought up in a sermon how the Islam very much was a reaction to Christianity as it was in the whenever Islam kind of six hundreds or something. Yeah. Yeah. And that one of the the things that they did that was ex, it was a reaction against the three godded Christianity to back to a act or like actually one God. Yeah. They thought that Christians worshiped the, 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 they thought the tri the Trinity was the God, the father and Mary. Huh? Because the Catholic church venerated Mary so highly. Right. And they didn't, there was like a misunderstanding about the spirit. Either way, they didn't like the idea. Yeah. But it's still more than, you know, more than more than one. one. Oh, I just remembered. It's it's too late for for your question. How how have I has it been explained to me before? I, I think this is kind of funny. The the Trinity had explained to me explained to me at one point, or maybe I made this up because I don't remember the source. But it's not one plus one plus one. It's one times one times one. Ooh, isn't that that's good? good? Yeah. <laughs> but then the problem to that is like, shouldn't it be like a a million or infinity times infinity times infinity <laughs> is still infinity, right? The so there's a there's a problem with our uh, with how we understand unity mathematically, you know, and then right. that, that's kind of the whole whole debate. And and there are semantics to it. For example, I I just heard this recently that how what you believe God was doing before creation as a like, Hey, what was God up to during Mm -hmm. before creation? How you answer that is a very good way to figure out what you actually think about God. Mm -hmm. Um, and then why he created people and the doctrine of the Trinity gives, gives a better reason for like, what was God doing anyways? And and then why did he start this whole drama um, with all these problems? Was he lonely? Or bored? Or bored. <laughs> Tired the, of talking to himself? Because the, the Trinity is the answer to like, no, God is a community. The essence of God is love. You can't love if you're, if you're just you. So you're a community of you know, infinity times infinity times infinity. And and creation is like the overflow of that love that community turns into more community, right? right. So again, that's totally starting with a conception of the Trinity and then working backwards. But some of the implications are, are well, then what's the whole, what's the whole point? But the day-to-day implications are nothing... <laughs> You know, it it is, I think, a very much a before times, end times, but not very much middle times difference. I guess where I'm, where I'm coming down with this whole thing and I've been interested to hear your thoughts. I, for, for quite a while, I haven't really, I haven't really thought that the concept of the Trinity makes any sense. I think there's one God. I think there's a, a lot of emphasis about, about that in the old Testament for a reason. Jesus and the apostles, that would have been their, their basis for their concept of God. And if there's only one God ver- and, and he doesn't have three parts versus the the common concept of the Trinity, I, I'm really having a hard time and I've had a hard time figuring out if that really makes a difference. 
and I can't figure out, I can't figure out how it does. Because, I mean, God is God, and we're trying to follow Him or them. Wait, see, that's <laughs> her. confusing. It's her, Steve. Her. <laughs> yeah. Can't say it. <laughs> trying to follow God, and it's it's one of those doctrines that's everybody talks about is so important and so central, and I can't figure out why. And maybe that's that's where I'm where my issue is in general. Why is it such a big deal? I feel like my thoughts about the gospel uh, are the same in tone to your thoughts about the Trinity because I, I'm always like, man, people really make a big deal out of this gospel, but it seems like everybody thinks it's a slightly different thing. And did Jesus? Mm-hmm. What did Jesus think the gospel was? And. Mm-hmm. And why do we keep calling it gospel anyways? Why couldn't we, you know, because gospel is, again, it's kind of a, let's say, a a construct looking back. We transliterated a word, but turned it into a, it, it now means more than what people. Right, it just meant like good news. Yeah, hey, I, I've, got, I've got good news for the poor, right? We turned it into good news with a capital G. Of course right. the gospel is important, um, but the it's just one of those things that we it's a way to summarize something kind of complicated in one word but then when we do that i'm not using it the same as the next person does that make sense so so yeah so i've had some of that same feeling for sure and i here are some of the big questions that i've been trying to figure out one is does the divinity of christ matter yeah. And the easy answer is yeah, depending on where you come that it's definitely going to influence the way you read the whole thing. Mm-hmm. And there are people who call themselves Christians who believe that Jesus was just a person and and was in no way, you know, unitarian thought is is that Jesus was the same as Gandhi or someone, you know. Right. But what did Jesus do when he came here and what did his death do or what is he doing now? You're going to come to a different uh, answer to those things depending on where you fall there. Or then like, does the Holy Spirit matter and what does it do and is it important and when when do you get it or do you get it or does everyone get it or, you know. <laughs> and then even my cop-out answer is, does God even matter? And I've been working on that one. And the, and the other things seem more uh, ephemeral. Is that a word? Yeah. They're, they're harder to grasp. And, and I, I feel like I, you know, I've got this pain because I feel like I grew up in a, in a tradition that talked about how important God was but then never acted that way. We acted like the importance of God is that he is the authority who set up the Bible. Now, right. what matters is, the, is that we worship and praise the Bible and listen to the Bible and have a relationship with the Bible. So I, I've been working on the, does God matter? I think, yes, he, she does. <laughs> and, <laughs> and trying to figure out that, and then the does the Holy Spirit matter and does the divinity of Christ matter are are things that are certainly built built into that question. Or the, or the like man, the um the birth of Christ is a is an extremely problematic story to me. Yeah. Um and I don't like it <laughs> because I don't like uh how much um how much it can emphasize this that um, sin comes through sex, mm, yeah, because it's certainly been used for that. That the reason Jesus could be perfect is because he had a a sexless beginning to the world. But I, I think that runs contrary to it has been made into something that I don't think it means. But it's also just a kind of a problematic story. The genealogies make it problematic because yeah, he, because he's also supposed to be in the 
are, are you allowed to do the genealogy through his dad if you don't believe that his dad was right. his dad? You know, so, um, but and, I've had a lot of these same thoughts. Yeah, it's a fourteen-year-old girl. Why couldn't Jesus have been a woman? Is a problem I have, right? Wouldn't that have mm. really upended things, right? Why did Jesus have to be a Jewish man? Why not a Gentile woman, right? Because she would have been killed and no one would have listened to her. Maybe it's a practical answer, but the there are some implications to those things that have had damaging repercussions, right? Uh, so there's my answer to myself so far is I don't, from C.S. Lewis again, uh, Aslan is not a tame lion, Oh, right. Yeah. So there are definitely mysteries that not only do I not understand, but I think there are mysteries that I would not, would not, you could not explain it to me because we're talking about when any time we talk about God, we are already flattening the 12 dimensional beast that we're talking about. Yeah. Words are problematic to describe a thing that, that whose words sustain and create the universe. So there's certainly things that I'm not going to understand, but that doesn't mean I'm not going to question, question them. Right. Yeah. And I've, I've had a lot of the same thoughts about the deity of Christ. Like, like, does it matter? And in some ways it, it seems like the gospel capital G would make more sense and be more, amazing if he wasn't god but i mean I, I it's it's you know even after prepping all the notes for our talk tonight and talking through this and thinking about the deity of christ and the holy spirit and all this stuff what i i keep coming back to is it going to change how i live for god and how i i i guess Growing up in the tradition we did, there's so much emphasis on, like you said, learning about the Bible, so much emphasis on your beliefs and the thoughts you had about things. I think that there was a lot of missing parts of faith by doing that. Yeah. And I I think I've mentioned it before, but Patrick Mead has a, a weekly series that he does on Monday mornings called Who Told You That? I think it's on the Our Safe Harbor Church YouTube channel. I'll stick a link in the show notes to it. But uh, a couple of Mondays ago on June 7th, he did a, a, a talk about who told you that you had to be a, a brand name Christian, I think is what it was called. And he was talking about what... God really asks of us. And I, I wrote this down because it just hit me. He said, it seems to matter more to God how you live for him rather than how, what you believe about him. And that, to me, that, that just emphasized, it underlined so much of what, where I'm trying to get to. It's, it's kind of interesting. And to me, because I'm a Bible nerd, it's fun to like comb through the, the scriptures for gems of Greek or Hebrew and all the history and all that stuff. But when it comes right down to it, I think that God is more concerned how we're living for him and and with him. Sky Jatani. We need a bell every time we mention we Sky. Do. We do. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's it's more important that we what we're li- doing for and with God than what we believe about God. And I think we get so wrapped up and wrapped around the axle about is it a trinity? Is it a duality? Is it the same substance or different modes? All this stuff. I think it's interesting to talk about, but I don't think it really impacts the fact that there's people in town here who need lunch on a Saturday because they're homeless. And I can go serve them with my neighbor, Bob. Yeah, you. I've I've been nodding furiously this this whole time because I I do. It's so easy for me to get stuck back in. Um, like I could talk about why it's important all day long, but where I have been personally, and I've expl- I have it on my desk actually because I I try to remember it and then I never look at this during the podcast. I have a matrix 
Um, cause I love impact matrixes. Do you use those at work? No. Oh, I, I mean, what? I might, but maybe. Yeah, wait, I've, I forgot that we're like stiff competitors and I should, maybe I shouldn't. <laughs> but the, um, yeah, just, uh, I don't know if, if I get fired, you should try to get me a, like a, I'll sweep the floors. I'll, or I'll cut all this out. Yeah. Um, <laughs> impact matrix. So it's a graph where you just on one axis, you graph something's impact. And then on the other um, axis, you're you're going to graph its um, effort. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's um, I'd be surprised. I didn't think you, of it in that term. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, in other words, if, if you have 10 things to do, then the thing you should do first is the thing that's easy but still has a high impact. And the thing that you maybe should never do is the thing that is difficult and it turns out it has a low impact although that's my favorite kind of thing to do i like <laughs> <laughs> i like just accomplishing you know meaningless things um anyways but i have a certainty matrix which is my certainty in a belief and its flux flux being the science term for how much it's changing mm -hmm. amount of change that a thing is happening or I could even say like the impact and flux. So I like to talk about things as if I have a high degree of certainty on everything and a low degree of flux, but my capacity for flux is high. And mm -hmm. the often I, w I want to talk about the thing that I am the least certain about and that is changing the most. Cause that's what is on the top of my mind mm -hmm. is like, I, and I like to, work things out by talking to people about them <laughs> and, and bounce bouncing ideas off. But any, anyways, all that to say where I've been trying to, to have my, the main part of my expression of my faith happen is in the greatest command. Yeah. Because I have been so stuck on all the least commands, getting all those things yeah. right that I'd never have, I don't, I do not follow the greatest command. And so I'm certainly in the, the position where in my renewing of trying to just love God and love other people, which is a, extremely unnatural to me, I get all these interesting things on the side as I'm divi diving into this. And I do think if my conception of God is completely wrong, I, I think that that is a like it's all, it's going to be completely wrong, even if I get my theology all correct. Hmm. Um, because again, I my mind is there is a there is a problem of degree and type in my mind comprehending God. You know. Yeah. Um, at the same time, so it, I do think in the in my day to day life, the answer is it's not important because I'm still just trying to do the. I'm still not doing the thing that he actually said is important. Hmm. And then on the periphery though, I see all these things, you know, where it's important is that people take their theologies and then turn it into more and more doctrine, which turns into their positions on things. And so as I'm trying to love God and love others, I very quickly run into like church. How should churches run? Who should the leaders be? Should, what should a how a, a, a family be? Mm -hmm. And people use their theology to justify all of these various these various stances. So the it, it's almost like the if I could just stop myself from following all of those rabbits and just keep doing the love God love others, it would work itself out. <laughs> but I I'm constantly wanting to get all of those things right. And hope that that makes me love God and love others, but I don't think it works that way. Yeah, I feel you completely. <laughs> I mean, when it comes down to it, it seems like the the primary thing is just love, letting me love. I mean, at, everything kind of flows from that, and it's it's just in in my nature from the way I've grown up. Maybe because I'm a human, I don't know, but it's just kind of in my nature to. Just get so wrapped around trying to figure out the intricacies and the details of something that nobody understands and maybe nobody can understand 
did I, I lose that, that just the core part of just love. Jesus says something like, if you, if you love me, you'll obey my commands or, or something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I had, I suddenly was like, I want to go through and see what Jesus's commands are. And I haven't finished this study. It'd be interesting if maybe you know more about this, but I started trying to find them. And w when I was asking that question, oh, what, what are Jesus's commands? I, I got frustrated because mm. I couldn't find them. But <laughs> then, but then um, suddenly there's one that just sticks out like a, it's just like an obvious, like, of course, because Jesus says, I am giving you a command right now. This is the command right. that I give you. And here's yes. the command that it will be. He's right. like, like really emphasizes. <laughs> yeah. Like here it is, folks, a new command I give you that yep. you love one another. Right. And then, so what are we supposed to do? Follow Jesus's commands. And we, we definitely debate it about Paul and Jesus and the things he said and what they mean for what we're supposed to do or not do. But it's that like there, it could not be clearer that at least if that's not the only one, it's at least the most important one because God, because yeah. Jesus said it was and, and just because of the way he lays it out. And then he has the audacity to say that love sums up the law and the prophets. Yeah. What? So <laughs> what are we supposed to do? Uh, love. What does all the Bible mean? In love. And it, yeah. and it, so if you're going to take an idea and put a lens on and go read the, the old Testament, that's the, that's the one Jesus said, try this one on for size, read back and, and, and see what that means. You made me think of the, this back to Patrick meet again, a while back, he posted on Facebook. He said, when I stress that the only law God gives us is love, I'm accused of trying to make religion easy and spineless. But have you ever tried loving people who accuse you of trying to make religion easy and spineless? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I, it's it's so true. Well, love's not easy. Yeah, and the yeah, I do think that the now that I'm one chapter into Jesus and John Wayne, the the I think there's a feeling that boiling everything down to love is like sissy. <laughs> yeah, you know, like oh, you're all lovey feely, but. Uh, Jesus's form of love what was his public humiliation and then um, execution and then you know saying forgive those people yeah and I I, I don't know who said it I'll, I'll try to look it up later but I recently read someone say it's easy to love humanity did you tell me this Let, let's go with yes I've is this a Steve quote um, it's easy to love humanity. It's very difficult to love a human. Oh yeah, I, that that wasn't me, but that's so true. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true because I, I can like, oh yes, men and women should hold hands. The right. races should should unite. The peoples of the globe. Oh, but I cannot stand this person that keeps saying this thing on Twitter. He's the worst. I hate him. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just so easy to be to you know. And I always, I have for much of my life always known that I always have a nemesis and I kind of like it. <laughs> like if I don't have a nemesis, I will raise one up for myself to just loathe and hate privately right. without telling him, but like, Oh, my nemesis is at it again <laughs> because I just thrive, um, thrive in that. But it's just so easy for me to. Yeah. So anyways, the starting with that command and then reading through scripture for what is man, what does this mean that God is love and that I'm supposed to love God and love others? It is simple. It's elegant. Yeah. It's, it's easy to, to summarize it, but man, it is the execution is I'm finding difficult. Yeah, you and me brother. Well, I'm not sure how we went from complex theological discussion of Trinity to simplifying it down to love, but I like it. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid that we're going to get burned at the stake. And so I wanted to, uh, well, yeah, <laughs> hedge, I'm hedging, I'm hedging the heresy with, but I said, love each other. <laughs> yeah.
Yeah, I, I, I'm gonna. I think I'm gonna try to read things through that lens. That's a good way to phrase that. It's a good way to frame it. The lens of loving people, because I do think that when that there's a lot that we spend a lot of time on that I think in the end doesn't matter, but love does. Which is a good book, by the way. <laughs> it is a good book, Bob Goff. Yeah. All right. Well, I better head out. Thanks for listening to me go on about this for a while. And man, I've got a lot to think about now. I'm, yeah. I'm gonna, I already my shelf my I'm not reading the books fast enough, including the Bible, the books of the Bible, and <laughs> right. the books that are just books. Like, it's like now now I got to go now I got to get some church history. I need to I need to figure out if there's some Christians who got away from the Roman Empire and ha- had their thing going and what they wrote about it. I need to <laughs> I need to read up on the on the Trinity and yeah. Well, good luck with that. Just more and more homework that I give myself. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus' burden is light, but my burden that I put on myself is um, that I have to know it all before I do anything. So right, maybe I should just do things. Dang it. <laughs> All right. All right. See you later. See ya. I had been screaming all these messages I thought you wanted to hear, but it only takes a whisper. Hey, thanks for listening to Following the Fire. If you'd like to see show notes for this episode, which includes links to everything we mentioned as well as all the scriptures, head on over to followingthefire.com and just click on this episode. There's also contact information on the website. Let us know what you think about the show and if you have any suggestions for future topics. Also, please give us a review on Apple Podcasts if you could. It really helps other folks find the show. And as always, thanks to the fabulous Daniel Wheat for the theme song and the music for the episode. You can find more of his stuff on Apple Music and Spotify. See you later. See you later.